we're talking about homes. And so last Sunday, we kind of introduced the, the thought or the theme. Uh, anybody remember how we defined the term or how we're going to work with the term home uh, as a church together? Somebody just, Ben? Good, thanks, Ben. So we're going to think about home as a place, the place where you belong. And ultimately, where did we say we belong last Sunday? As Christians, if we've trusted in Christ, then heaven is our, is our true home. Heaven is the place where we, we belong, which in order for heaven to be our true home, then, then earth kind of becomes, uh, Hebrews said that, that Abraham and other people of faith looked at earth as strangers and pilgrims. There was a way in which they didn't belong here. And so we're, we're going to explore that. How do we live here and how do we make our homes here and yet be strangers and pilgrims and not belong here? How much should we belong to this earth and how much should we not belong to this earth? So I, I wanted to, for the next four weeks, kind of talk about four different categories or four different homes that God has created for us and that we see through Scripture the different kinds of homes that he has given his people here on earth. What are they supposed to look like? What are they not supposed to look like? And, and think about those four different categories together. When I started thinking about, well, okay, what, what is home? What, what is the epitome of, of home here on earth? Heaven is our, is our ultimate home, and we're headed towards that home. But here on earth, what is home? Immediately, I don't know where your mind goes to. I mean, you can kind of tell where my mind goes to with the banner. My mind thinks of, of a house, of a place, a family, the place where you grow up, the place where you think, that's my home. From our earliest days, that's probably the place when you refer to go home or where is your home. That's what we think. Where's my bed? Where's my family? We think of that as our home. But, but as then I started digging a little bit deeper. I found that there's a home that we have that supersedes that home. There's a home that we have that, that is more permanent, more integral to who we are than the place where our family lives, the place where we sleep, the place where we eat. Any ideas where we're headed with this one? The womb? That's where, that's where the home starts. That's, that's the first home. But even in the womb, we have a home that God gives us from, from the very first breath or brainwave or, or, or beat of your heart to the very end, you have a home. You all brought your home here with you, right? You all came in a home. L look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and, and then we'll all be on the same page together. At the end of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, Paul's talking about how he's looking towards the invisible things instead of the visible things. He's focused on the things you can't see. And he's playing with that word we talked in Hebrews 11 about faith and sight. He's, he's playing with that concept again in, in 2 Corinthians 4. It says, we do not lose heart even though our outward man, the, our bodies are perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So 4.17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What home is Paul focused on? All right. Welcome this morning. Here we go. 4.17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Where is that exceeding and eternal weight of glory? There we go. Now we're, now we're with me. While we do not look at the things which are seen. And that's a, he's, he's playing with those words. We do not look at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The homes that we have now are temporary. We have no continuing city. We have no continuing home. But we seek the one to come. Then he starts talking about the very, the, the most basic and primary home every one of us has in chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, 
is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What is Paul talking about? Paul says, if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have another house that's waiting for us, and, and instead, of a, uh, instead of a tent, it's an actual building, something that, that you can live in, something that, that stands up, a permanent dwelling place, as opposed to a, a nomadic type existence. What's Paul talking about, the earthly house? Somebody, somebody tell us. Our bodies. God has given you a, a home, and the, the very most basic place where you belong, if you belong nowhere else, you belong in your body. You will always, you have no experience outside of that home. Uh, it's kind of weird, but, but walk with me here. There, there, it's impossible for you to experience anything uh, if, we're, if we're rational, if, if we cut out weird things. It's impossible for you to experience anything outside of this home that God has given to you called your body. So, so every home you experience, whether it be a building where you sleep with your family, whether it be a church where you call this your church home, or a country, or a nation, whatever home you experience, first and foremost you experience it in this home, this physical house, this tent that Paul says, God has given us a tent to live in. So he says, we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And then he says in verse 2, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. Paul doesn't like his tent very much. He says, we groan. Now, now follow down to verse 4. For we, are who in, we who are in this tent, what does he say again? We who are in this tent groan, being burdened. Not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. That mortality, that's the body you have right now. No matter what Reuben has told me about all these cartoons and Marvel and DC tell you, your body is mortal. It will decay, it will grow old, and it will eventually, you will move out of your home. You'll, you'll leave your tent. So he says, we groan that mortality, our earthly body, may be swallowed up by life. Our permanent home. Our, our building that we get to live in forever. Why does he say we groan? Twice. He says, in this tent, I'm groaning. Twice. So I started thinking, well, why do I groan when I'm in a tent? Usually it's because I don't have my nice bed underneath me, or I'm cold, or the very worst thing that can happen in a tent, which is what, uh, the water comes through. Have any of you woken up wet? Uh, I'm talking to soldiers. <laughs> How many of you have had that experience where you're in a tent, you go to sleep dry, and you wake up and your sleeping bag is wet, your clothes are wet, your backpack is wet, I, I cannot think of, of many more miserable experiences than waking up wet in a tent where, where somehow either it's leaked or, or somebody has touched the roof. You know, you always tell people, don't touch it. As long as you don't touch it, the water will keep going off. But you touch it, all of a sudden, it soaks right through. So Paul is saying, I'm in this tent. And in this tent, basically, if I can paraphrase for Paul, there are holes in our tent. We, we have a tent that God gave us and the tent is leaking. Why would God give us a leaky tent? I hope that's all making sense. I'm, I'm speaking in a couple of different weird uh, analogies. Why would God give us a tent that leaks, that makes us groan, that, that at certain times we're, we're miserable in? Originally, God didn't give us a leaky tent, right? God gave us a pretty fantastic tent to spend our time here in. And we've done some things to this tent. So let's, let's look at that. That's kind of the, the idea of this sermon. What has happened to our tent? What's happened to our bodies? Why, why do we groan? Why are we at times miserable in this home that God has given to us? What's happened? Um, you think about Genesis, you think about what God tells us about how he made man, 
And one of the most important things, one of the things that jumps out at you is that we were created, is this working? Yeah, there we go. We were created in the image of God, but our home has been marred by sin. So most of the time we're going to spend in Genesis. If you want to turn back to Genesis chapter 2. Near the, the way Genesis is written in chapter 1, he kind of gives you an overview of all the things that God made on the different days. And then in Genesis chapter 2, he comes back and gives you details about the overview that you get in, in Genesis chapter 1. So in, verse one, in chapter 1, 26, it says, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then one, Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. I've told you before about things to pay attention to when you're reading the Bible. Repetition is one of those things you need to pay attention to. So when, when Moses writes and says in verse 17, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. He's saying the same thing again so that you don't miss it. And he's already said it in verse 26. Let us make man in our image. So God made man in his image. In his image, he made man. What do you think we're supposed to take away from that? That we were made in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. Male and female both are made in the image of our creator. And, and there's all sorts of discussions and debates about what that means. What is it that separates humans from the rest of creation. What is it about us that reflects the image of God? I don't believe it's our physical bodies. I don't think it's the tense that, that God has a body and so he, he gave us a body. I think it's something about who we are and something about the way God made us. We could talk the rest of the sermon about what that means. I think what almost everyone will agree on is that being made in the image of God gave us a capacity to know God and to relate to God. We have a God consciousness that the rest of creation is made with naturally, that, that it naturally does things that glorifies God, the mountains and scenery and even the animals and the way, they, the way they follow God's plan glorifies him, but they don't consciously know and think, I want to glorify God by what I'm doing. They do it without knowing it, without thinking about it. Man has a consciousness of our creator. We, we know that there is a God, and we, we have a choice of glorifying God or rebelling against God. It, you think even the people who deny God know that there's something messed up about mankind. They always talk about man and nature. Nature is so great, nature does everything great, and then man messes everything up. Even in that concept, even in that thought, they're acknowledging that there's something different about mankind. There is something that mankind has that nature does not have. There is a choice and a will and a spiritualness to man that I think is, is greatly reflected when God says we are made in the image of God. God has made us to know him. God has made us to relate to him, which is a beautiful thing and a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a great feature of the tent he gave us, of the life we have here, except when we rebel against that. And if you've read the first three chapters of Genesis, God, God gives and God gives and God gives, and he says, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then man chooses to go against what God has given, against what God has told. Chooses to rebel. And that's why this, this second part, we are created in the image of God, but our home has been marred by sin. Even that image of God has been marred. Our, our understanding, our connection to God. God says, in the day you eat of it, talking about the tree, fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And Satan comes and says, are you really going to die? And they eat of it, and they don't fall down dead. Therefore, God is a liar, right? 
God says, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. You're, the thing that is most beautiful about you is going to be marred and, and touched. Your relationship with me is going to be separated because of the sin that you, because of sin. So we're created in the image of God, but our home is marred by sin. In the tent illustration, God has given us this incredible, wonderful tent to live in on our time here on earth, and yet we, ha we have damaged it, we have abused it, we have torn it up through sin. So, so what does that look like? How does that happen? First of all, he says right there in chapter 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then you go over to chapter 2, verse 7. It says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living, be living being. Then later on, God is, is looking at man. In verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. I'll make male, I made Adam, I'm going to make a helper that's equal to him, that, 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 that fits, that complements each other. And, and he first, he, he has Adam look at all of the animals, and all the animals come before him, male and female, male and female, male and female, male and female. Always, it's as if God is teaching Adam a lesson, and some, some men need to be taught this lesson. It is not good for you to be alone. You, you can't do everything on your own. You need somebody. You need somebody to, to come alongside of. So Adam gave names to all the camels, to the birds of the air, verse 20. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. Verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The story is beautiful, because it tells us that man and woman were not made as, as a hierarchy. Man and woman were made out of each other. Man, woman was made out of man. So there's, there's a partnership and an equality that is, that is beautiful. God has designed male and female to work together, to come together, to go together. He made us male and female to complement one another. And that's how we use the tense, right? That's, that's exactly the way it's been ever since, that, that this beautiful symmetry, this beautiful dance of companionship and complementary view of life is, is how the tent works. We've taken that tent and we've gouged this big hole in it saying one has to be better than the other. One has to, one has to be first and one has to be second. And, and it goes back and forth. I, I've been praying a lot the last several years. I grew up with four boy, uh, with three brothers, so there were four boys in my house. And I loved being a boy. I was a boy through and through. And, and, and I didn't like girls very much. And then you, you, you become a teenager, and all of a sudden you start to like girls where you didn't like girls before. But I found that I didn't, I liked them, but I still, in a, in, a law, in a large way, didn't respect them, didn't see them as equal to me. And that's something, it's not something my parents taught me, it's, it's just maybe something I taught myself. And, and over the past many years, I've had to really look at myself, at the way I view women, the way I view my wife and my daughter and the way I think about women. It's, it's been challenging to, to attack my own presuppositions. I believe that God made man and woman, man, male and female, to, to complement each other. I do not believe that they're interchangeable. 
that everything men can do, women can do, everything women can do, men can do. That, I don't believe God designed or created the tent, the body, that way. I mean, all the way down to physically, it's obvious that God made us differently. And yet, there's, there's a huge gap between different and unequal. And a lot of times, we, we go from we're different to I'm better because I'm different. So, so that's been a challenge for me, to think through how I view women. It's awkward to say it in front of a group of women. I, I have to challenge my own presuppositions, the things I've always thought, the way I view, yeah. God made us male and female to complement one another, but we use it to compete with each other. Instead of embracing the complementary form that he made us, we always want to see who's better, who's got the upper hand, who's got the upper edge. And I'm going I'm to stop there and move on. But, but something in our, in our bodies that God has given to us as a gift of, of the difference between male and female, that God designed and God gave us to help each other, to, to make each other better, to make each other whole, we use it so often against each other. We use it to, to tear each other down. And, and not only in a husband-wife relationship, but, but in a society. We use our bodies, whether they were made male or whether they were made female, against the other gender. Which, which leads into the, the next thing. At the end of chapter 2, he's talking about marriage, and Adam's so excited about the wife that God has made for him. It says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so he's talking about this marriage partnership that, that husbands and wives come into, becoming one flesh, which is emotionally, which is um, on a soul level, and it's certainly on a physical level. The, the, the act of sex is a husband and a wife coming together and becoming one flesh. And then he says this strange little thing at the end of the chapter, verse 25. They were both naked. I know some of the kids, this is gross talk, okay? But just plug your ears for a little bit if, if you get grossed out. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. I want you to, to write this down. God made us sexual and pure. Which is, a, which is a really cool combination. Because so often we think it's one or the other. You can either be pure or you can be sexual, but you can't be both. But, but God created them sexual beings. God has made us sexual beings who, who have a drive towards sex, have a desire for sex. That's, that's part of the tent that God gave us. That's a feature in the tent. And yet, at the same time, he made them pure. He made them naked, where, where they're, they're walking around naked with each other, and, and there's no shame, and there's no awkwardness. Because there's, there's no abuse going on. There, there's no taking going on. The, the sexuality between Adam and Eve, before sin comes in, what, what verse 25 seems to be saying is there's this openness there's between a husband and a wife there's this open sexuality that doesn't have to be hidden it doesn't have to be embarrassed or ashamed about because it is a gift from God and it is a pure thing between them then notice if you know the story they sin they, they both choose to eat from the tree, and as soon as they sin, what happens? Well, let's, let's see, where is it? Verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and, that they, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. 
But let's just assume it's still just Adam and Eve. There's no children around. It's, it's, the, the narrative that we're given in Genesis is it's the two of them. Nothing has changed except their awareness and their, their nature. I, I've said before, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They already knew good, so what did they learn by tr eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Their minds were opened to evil. Their eyes were opened to evil. Just, just think through how this happened. One day before evil entered, they're, they're completely comfortable and open, naked in front of each other because they're sexual and they're pure together. So their, their sexuality is not a problem. Their desire for each other is not a problem. Then all of a sudden, this comes in and and now something, even in front of their own husband, their own wife, now they're looking at each other and they're saying, I feel weird being naked in front of you. So it makes me wonder, is there something about the way they look at each other now? Is there something about the way they think about their own bodies, the way they think about their spouse's body, that all of a sudden their eyes have opened, something has changed, and now instead of being pure and sexual, they're sinful and sexual. And, and that leads to them saying, even though you're my husband, even though you've already seen me naked, even though you're my wife, you've already seen me naked, there's something about me that wants to cover myself even in front of you. I think a psychologist could go crazy there with, with, with what's going on inside Adam and Eve for them to say, I want to cover myself from you. I feel ashamed, I feel uncomfortable being naked in front of you, I want covering. What's happened to the tent? What's happened to the body that now, instead of an openness and a purity, there's a shame and a, and a closeness that's come on us? God made us sexual and pure, but we use sex for our selfish desires. You think about why we groan within these bodies. I know from a lot of men that I've talked to, as well as my own personal experiences, part of the groaning in this body is we've been given this sexual desire, and, and this is true for women as well. We're given this sexual desire, this sexual part of, of the tent that God gave us, and yet it's so difficult to exercise and to to practice that sexuality in a pure way. And that battle of, of, of the sexualness, the sexuality of us, as well as the, the desire for purity, to get that balance right becomes so difficult. And, and marriage, uh, some, of, some of you teenagers, you know, when I was a teenager, I thought, well, man, once I got married, then it's like I can have sex every day, and so sex won't be a problem anymore. Right? I mean, that's the way marriage works. All of a sudden, this, this battle with sexuality and purity goes away because you're married. And, and, and women, uh, maybe, you, maybe you think the same thing. And, and what we find once we get married is it doesn't go away, oddly enough. That battle, this balance of, of trying to exercise our sexuality and also maintain purity. It, Purity doesn't mean virginity. Are you following that? Sex, the sexuality that God has given us can be exercised in a, in a beautiful and pure way. And that, that battle, I know for a lot of people, for, you look at our culture, and that battle is, is making our culture groan inside of their tents. It, it, it is causing a lot of pain. It's causing a lot of heartache this issue of human sexuality and our sexuality in our bodies. So God made us male and female. God made us sexual. Male and female we use as competition. Sexuality we use instead of a gift, instead of something we, we give, it's something we take and it's something we want. Another thing that God gave them in Genesis chapter 2 um, let me see the exact verses where we're talking about this. Eight and nine. The Lord God, 
this is kind of neat. I don't know if you've thought about this before. The Lord God planted a garden. So, so if you're a gardener, you're godly, because God planted a garden. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow. C.S. Lewis, um, we, kids and I were just reading The Magician's Nephew, which is kind of the first in his series of Narnia. And he talks about, they, they go to this world Narnia, and he pictures what it looks like for God to make a, a world and for, to have it come alive. And he has things just popping up out of the ground everywhere. And even the light post, the lamp that you see in The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is because they had a bar from a light post that got stuck in the ground. And Narnia, I know this is nerding some of you out, but Narnia was so full of life that even this little light post that got stuck in the ground grew to be a lamp. So here God is in the garden, planting a garden, and then it says in verse 9, Out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. God gave us food as a gift. We've talked about this before. It's incredible that, that our creative God loves us so much that he wanted us to have food as a gift. I feel bad for my dogs. They eat the same thing every day, twice a day. I give them the same food, and they crunch it down, and then in the evening, they get the same food the next day, the next day, the next day. Except our lab is three years old today, so he gets a special treat for his birthday. <laughs> but day after day, it's the same thing. God could have made us to eat the same thing. God could have made us to, to eat a tasteless piece of cardboard that would give us the nutrients we need to make us stay alive. And yet, in grace and in love, God has given us not just food that tastes good but is the same. I mean, we could go from a piece of cardboard to a piece of steak, but that's all you get. You get steak each day and every day, which would be an improvement on cardboard, but man, would that get tiring. And yet God gives us this unbelievable range of flavors and textures, of spices and sauces. It's it's unbelievable, the gift of God, just, just in our food. And yet, what have we done with that? Our relationship with food is often a fight. Instead of a gift that God has given to us, sin has, has corrupted even that, and, and God warned them after the curse. He said, now, instead of me growing this garden, and you basically... You get the sense that tending the garden meant go pick as much fruit as you wanted. And, and their work in the garden was basically trying to decide what delicious food they wanted to eat that day. And now God says, now you're going to have to, I've heard the Hebrew is basically, you're going to have to scratch out of the ground something to eat. Now instead of this gift that I've given to you, now you will have to work, and he says, by the sweat of your brow you will feed yourself. You'll, You'll make your living through sweat and work. And as I was reading that, I was thinking, well, that doesn't really apply to us anymore. I mean, we, through our sciences and through our farming, we've gotten food down to where I don't sweat very often getting my food. And, and so I was kind of thinking, how does that curse, has man found, have we found our way around that curse? But just, just think, have we solved the food problem? I mean, now there are so many people who are concerned about the way we've gotten around, the way we're getting such big, it should freak you out how big chicken legs are. Because you eat a German chicken drumstick and it's like a tiny little piece of meat and then you see an American chicken drumstick and it looks like a turkey. I mean, it's, it's scary sometimes to see American drum, okay. So, so we start to ask ourselves, have we really fixed the food problem or have we just changed the food problem? Do we really not have a battle with food anymore? You look at either way, either obesity or starving, and, and Americans are talking about food a lot. We're talking about what kind of food we eat, we're talking about how much food we eat, or we're talking about people who have disorders who either won't eat or who will eat and then purge themselves of what they've eaten. 
This gift that God has given in this tent has, has taken on all sorts of twisted parts of our lives. How many people, thinking about the new year, thought about something to do with their diet in 2015? How many people did not think about something to do with their diet, but probably should have thought about <laughs> something to do with their diet? Yep. So, so the gift of God of sex, we've taken it and we've made it a problem in our lives. The gift of God of food, we've taken it. And I'm not saying we can't enjoy sex and don't enjoy sex. I'm not saying we can't enjoy food and don't enjoy food. But it is an issue that a lot of times makes us groan in this tent of ours. Eating the right amount of the right stuff. Enjoying it without enjoying it too much. Our life itself, we already read the verse earlier in chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. I think it's incredible that our life comes from the breath of God. And, and I believe God continues to breathe life into mortal bodies to make them come alive. And, and the question becomes, when does that happen? At what point, and I don't have time to chase this down, but at what point does God breathe life into cells and turn them into a living being? Our life came from the breath of God, and then sin entered, and the, that, that relationship with God was marred, and then it says later that God says we, we have to cut them off from the tree of life. And, and, and something about God sustaining goodness and gift to man and our health and our life is, is removed from us. And so now, instead of God protecting us from any kind of harm and any kind of sickness and any kind of disease and any kind of pain, that is taken away and, and we experience all of those things in this tent that we live in. God breathes healthy life into our bodies and I think almost, almost with, a, with a play on that, if you look at Psalm 39, so many times, what is our life compared to? A breath, or a vapor, or a mist. Psalm 39, 4 to 6 says it well. Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Some of us, as, as you get older, you don't have to be reminded very often how frail you are. But I imagine some of you, especially some of you young soldiers, you, you begin to think you're, you're invincible, that nothing can hurt you. And it doesn't take much to break that, to shatter that dream, that fantasy, that that your body is, is more than a, a vapor. It doesn't take seeing many people bleed or die to remind you that your body, your life, is not much more than a vapor. Make me to know my end, what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state, is but vapor. The strongest person in here, the healthiest person among us, is but a vapor. I was looking through um, some of the stats about this, this life that we live. The healthiest person alive, cut off from oxygen, would last about at the most, 30 minutes. So it doesn't matter what you eat. It doesn't matter how strong your immune system is. It doesn't matter how much you can bench press. You're 30 minutes at any given moment. Let's be honest, you're, you're three seconds away from dying. But, but you lose just one part of your, of your system. You lose oxygen. And at the most, you're 30 minutes away from dying. Um, then if you're exposed to the cold, 
without any kind of shelter, without any kind of warmth, you're about three hours from dying. If you lose water, you're about three or four days from dying. If you lose food, you're about three or four weeks from dying. So we, we think of ourselves as, as these, sometimes we think that we're living in a permanent building. Remember what did Paul say we're living in? A tent. We, you are in a temporary shelter. Don't fool yourself to think, you know, you can put up curtains if you want, but it's not going to last. It is a tent. 30, 30 minutes, three hours, three days, three weeks. Or stepping in front of the wrong vehicle. I mean, any one of us is a moment away from leaving this tent behind. Then the last one, I, I thought it was cool how God brought this together. I was not tracking at all what, what this weekend is, and somebody said there was a four-day weekend, and I was like, we just had like 17 four-day weekends. Why is this another four-day weekend? And then I remember that it's, it's Martin Luther King Jr. Day tomorrow. Talking about the bodies that we've been given. Uh, I've got a video clip I want to watch, and then we'll, we'll close. When we look at modern man, we have to face the fact that modern man suffers from a kind of poverty of the spirit, which stands in glaring contrast to his scientific and technological abundance. We've learned to fly the air like birds. We've learned to swim the seas like fish. And yet we haven't learned to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. From, are we brothers and sisters? You, you think about all the different nationalities or all the different ethnic backgrounds, even, even in this small sample of, of this body, of this church, are we brothers and sisters? Well, you go back, what, what did God create us? God created Adam and Eve. From them came the nations through Noah and his family. That means that every one of us is connected to each other. There's a, there's a point, we talk about races all the time. What race are you? What race are you? What race are you? Ultimately, there's, there's only one race in the earth. We, we are all part of the human race. We're all part of the same race. There, there's no divisions of this race and that race. We're all connected as brothers and sisters. God made us to be brothers and sisters. And the very fact of this weekend reminds us... Is that the way we're living out our life in these tents? That we, that we look each other and we view and we say, there's my brother, there's my sister. Think about, think about how shallow it is to look at someone else with a different colored tent and to say, you're, you're different from me. You're not as good as me. You're, you're not equal to me. And, and it gets even more shallow than that. We, Young people, you go to school and you judge people not just based on the color of their skin, but on the clothes that they wear and what brand shoes they have on. I mean, in our bodies, as we look at each other, we judge each other on such superficial, shallow things as far as the way we treat each other. And, and here is a weekend that is set apart in America to, to actually think about and to remember where we've come from and and how far we still have to go. It's, it's unbelievable. With an African American as a president, how much strife and conflict we have in America over, over what color people's skin is. We groan within ourselves. We groan in the tent we live in. And there are, there are so many things that God gave us 
bodies. God gave us homes. And he said, even though this is a temporary home, this is still a good home. This is still a home you can enjoy and live in. And, and we have managed to abuse it and to punch holes into it. And now we find ourselves waking up and, and our sleeping bags are wet and we're miserable and we're groaning. And like Paul says, we're, we're waiting for the redemption. We're waiting for, for when we can be taken out of this tent and given a true building, a true home. So what's the point of all of this? What do, we go, what do we leave? And how do we live differently? How do we think differently? One of my main points I told you last Sunday, uh, I want to hammer it over and over again, is that you are not home yet. When you groan and when you experience these male-female conflicts, when you groan and experience these sexual conflicts and food conflicts and health conflicts and racial or, or getting along with people conflicts, it's a reminder that, that you are living in a temporary tent and it ought to push you to say, God, give me a home. I want to go to where I belong, to where I can enjoy life with my brothers and sisters to where I can enjoy you, to where I can come back to the home that you created me for. This, this past month in our home, we've going, been going through a lot of physical pain and a lot of physical problems. And over day after day, it's a reminder that, that these bodies are not our true homes. Don't get fooled into thinking this is all there is. This is what life is about. Even your physical health problems. In, in Sunday school, we talked about a grandfather who just passed away and, a, and another father who was having open heart surgery. You will see reminder after reminder, today, tomorrow, this week, that these bodies are not your true home. We have no continuing city especially the bodies that we live in, and we seek the one that is to come. Long for and look forward to the home that God has for us. Let's pray together. Mm -hmm.